So I'm delighted that this year Earth Overshoot Day will be launched in Glasgow because of course it's in Glasgow for COP26 that will come together next November to drive forward action on the climate agenda. Together we can move the date for Earth Overshoot Day and I'm standing for us doing it together collectively by design rather than through a chaotic process. You know, the multilateral process behind COP26 and the invitation to all organisations and individuals to join forces in the race to zero represent the, um, the very best of us, the opportunity to collaborate, to innovate and to deploy the task of foresight which our imagination allows us to do. Earth Overshoot Day is a reminder that, that we can and must come together to deploy these tools so that we can leave the future that we can be proud of to unborn generations to come. The Joint Ecological Footprint Initiative between York and the Global Footprint Network is a shared effort to enhance the foundational national footprint and biocapacity accounts. These accounts are the foundation of the Global Footprint Network's ecological footprint metric, which is updated annually with UN data so countries can determine whether they are on track to meeting the sustainable development goals. The footprint also gives us the data to calculate Earth Overshoot Day. At a time when the COVID-19 pandemic has shown us the true scale of our global interconnectedness, we have an opportunity to leverage partnership and collaboration to overcome the challenges that face us all. As we mark Earth Overshoot Day, York University affirms our commitment to working with local and global communities for a more sustainable future. The COVID-19 pandemic has tragically reminded us as humanity that what matters most in life is well-being of all people and of our planet. The business community has also been brutally challenged to see that the business of business can only be sustainable if it is invested in life-giving processes that promote the regeneration of Mother Earth. Earth Overshoot Day is an occasion for us to be reminded that we are stronger together and that together we have to learn from Mother Nature and learn to live in harmony. I believe strongly that uh, the day, the overshoot day is so important because we can uh, think about what happens in the past and uh, how you can improve the quality of life and delay the overshoot day. Let's do that. Earth Overshoot Day has come later this year because of the spread of the COVID-19 and the imposed slowdown. But this is not the way we want to remember it. Today, we want to make a call to reflect on the lessons we have learned during this pandemic. That together, we are stronger. That we are far more connected than we realized. That by protecting ourselves, we also protect others. And perhaps most importantly, that once people recognize that their own lives and the ones of their loved ones are under risk, public will becomes unstoppable. Hello everyone, good evening, good afternoon, and of course, good morning, depending on where in the world you're joining us from today. On behalf of the Scottish Environment Protection Agency, the University of Glasgow, and the Global Footprint Network, a very warm, of course, virtual welcome to the global launch webinar of Earth Overshoot Day 2020. I'm your host for the occasion. Um, my name is Steph McGovern. I'm a business journalist and broadcaster. Uh, but first up, I want to say a huge thank you to both SEPA and to the University of Glasgow Centre for Sustainable Solutions 
for putting this event on. As you know, this year, Earth Overshoot Day falls on the 22nd of August, three weeks later than in 2019. And I'm sure you won't be surprised to hear that this is a direct consequence of the COVID lockdowns, which we've all experienced across the world. Uh, so it's not a long-term solution. We all know that. And we know that a lot more needs to be done. And the science is clear on the scale of the challenge and the urgency to act. So in this session, we're going to hear from a series of Scottish, UK, European and global leaders who are driving action on this. Let's face it, it's one of the biggest issues of our time. And of course, as was mentioned in the film, next year, the eyes of the world will focus on Scotland as world leaders gather, we hope physically, uh, in the city of Glasgow for COP26, the Global Climate Conference. Now, Scotland has a vision for global environmental leadership and a great story to tell. And tonight, I'm delighted to welcome the Scottish Government's Cabinet Secretary for the Environment climate change and land reform, Rosanna Cunningham, MSP. Also with us, we have an excellent cast list, let me tell you, Mathis Wackernagel, who is founder and president of the Global Footprint Network. We've got Terry Ahern, who's chief executive of the Scottish Environment Protection Agency, Sandrine dixon de Cleve, who's co-president of Club of Rome, John El El Elkington, who's founder and chief pollinator, what a title, of Volans and the Triple Bottom Line, Dagmar Drogsma, who's director of industry for the Scottish Whiskey Association, Association, and Professor Jamie Tony, who is Director of Centre of Sustainable Solutions at the University of Glasgow. And alongside them, we have Katrina Patterson from the 2050 Climate Group. So quite a mix of experience and uh, background there in this session. And we are keen for you to be part of this, of course, too. Uh, so please check out the live polls, which are in the session. You will see them uh, alongside uh, being able to watch this. Uh, you can make comments, you can ask questions and share as well your views on social media using the hashtag move the date so do get involved with that I will keep across it as well and make sure I get as many of your questions answered along the way to our fantastic panelists too now before we kick off with our first panel session uh, we're going to hear from some different perspectives to set some context uh, to this discussion so we're going to start with Mathis Wackernagel who's founder and president of the Global Footprint Network Mathis over to you Thank you, Steph. It's a pleasure uh, to be here with you all together, uh, unfortunately virtually. So from January 1st to August 22nd, humanity has used as much from nature as ecosystems on this planet are able to renew within one year. Now, how do we know that? Pretty simply because we have one planet and the planet provides all life and about a quarter of the surface of the planet is ecologically highly productive that provides us most of what we want and if we divide that area by number of people that are on the planet we have about 1.6 hectares of ecologically productive space available and that should also leave space for wild species when we then look at how much we use to produce our food fiber to absorb co2 uh, to the CO2 from fossil fuel burning to accommodate our cities it adds up to 2.5 global hectares or more and it's possible to use more like with money we can spend more money than we earn we can spend more by emitting more CO2 that can be absorbed by cutting trees more rapidly than they're being uh, regrown by catching more fish than restock etc so there's a imbalance of our budget and that's why when we translate that the ratio is about 1.6, meaning we go 60% too fast. It's like using 1.6 Earth. Or if we translate that in time, it's like using, from as I said, from January 1st to, to August 22nd, as much as Earth can renew in the entire day. That's why Earth Overshoot Day falls on August 22nd. But that's just one part of it. The key part of it is actually that we can move the date. It's not a good idea, obviously, to be stuck on August 22nd. Now, when we look at the past, the green part of the graph shows how much of the year was covered by regeneration and how much by depletion. And when we look at the last year, we can see that the regenerative part has grown quite substantially. Actually, our demand has reduced because of COVID about 10%, but it has reduced by tragedy. It has reduced by disaster, not by design. We will have to live within the budget of the planet. That's not the choice. The question is how? 
know, are we getting there by design or are we getting there by disaster? That's why SEPA puts forward to say, we need one planet prosperity because the only alternative to one planet prosperity is one planet misery. And so the choice is pretty easy. Let's move the date. Thank you very much. Uh, some fantastic statistics there. It's incredible to think, isn't it? Humanity using 1.6 Earth. Uh, and we'll map this. I know we'll have plenty of questions for you throughout the discussion. But let's hear now from Rosanna Cunningham, MSP, who's Cabinet Secretary for Environment, Climate Change and Land Reform. And she's uh, recorded a little speech for us and then we'll be participating live throughout the discussion. I'd like to start by welcoming you to Scotland, to the University of Glasgow and this virtual event. Thank you for joining us to mark Earth Overshoot Day, a striking reminder of the urgency of the climate emergency and the need for global cooperation and action. This is part of a series of ongoing conversations on climate change, which will stretch through and beyond November 2021 when Glasgow hosts the rescheduled COP26. Scotland is ambitious. We have set the toughest climate change targets in the world and we are showing a strength of global leadership that is important right now. The Scottish Government, our agencies like SEPA, who are co-organisers, national and international organisations, public, private and third sector partners, are all coming together this evening to show solidarity in our fight against climate change and the need to use our natural resources sustainably. I'm particularly pleased to see the voices of young people being heard. There is no doubt that young people have been instrumental in bringing the threat of climate change to the fore of public consciousness and I'm looking forward to the discussion this evening. Our virtual meeting this evening by its very nature reminds us of the current challenging circumstances. COVID-19 has impacted our lives in so many ways. It has brought grief and hardship to many and our thoughts remain with those who have lost loved ones to this virus. But amid the difficulty, the climate emergency has not gone away, far from it, and the Scottish Government remains absolutely committed to ending Scotland's contribution to climate change and biodiversity loss. We may have had to delay some aspects of our work, but what has not changed is our commitment to a just transition to net zero emissions by 2045, and importantly, to reducing our emissions by 75% by 2030. I note that Earth Overshoot Day is three weeks later than last year, which is a direct result of COVID-19 lockdowns around the world. While no aspect of COVID-19 is to be celebrated, this underlines the changes we can see in our environment in the long term if, at this critical juncture, we refuse to return to some of our previous ways. We must learn lessons for the future to redesign our economy and ways of life to deliver greener, more sustainable societies through a green recovery. Scotland sees a green recovery as one that delivers economic, social and environmental well-being and responds to climate change and biodiversity loss. These twin challenges are intrinsically linked. The one affects the other. Changes in biodiversity directly and indirectly influence the ability of ecosystems to provide services that support life. Services ranging from the provision of food, water, energy and medicines through to pollination, flood control and the regulation of water quality, pollution and climate change itself. Of course, one further ecosystem service that has been very much in the spotlight throughout the COVID pandemic is the social dimension, particularly the physical, mental and emotional health benefits that derive from being with nature in the countryside and in green spaces within cities. Indeed, the COVID pandemic has reminded us how important it is to live in harmony with nature. Healthy biodiversity and the ecosystem services that it provides are key for human well-being and to build the resilience of our cities and regions both during and after the pandemic and it should be central to our recovery. We recently convened an advisory group to the Scottish Government to consider economic recovery in light of COVID-19. The Scottish Government's response to the Advisory Group on Economic Recovery's report sets out a number of steps that we are taking or will take to address many of these challenges and underpin a green recovery from the COVID crisis. For example, our commitment to significant investment in natural capital and nature-based solutions, including peatland restoration and woodland expansion, offers the potential to simultaneously tackle many of these challenges. 
These habitats not only lock up greenhouse gases and support rich and unique ecosystems, they can also reduce flood risk, improve water quality, provide spaces for connecting with nature and support the creation of a range of skilled green jobs. These ecological, climate and societal co-benefits are central to our recovery plans. Our vision for Scotland's future is one that is sustainable and inclusive and which centres around the well-being of people and planet. This means ensuring that our recovery delivers a greener, fairer and more sustainable society and economy. The well-being of Scotland's citizens, economy and natural environment can help enable sustainable growth, supporting the well-being of future generations. Social justice and environmental health has to be at the heart of this and any decision about the economic activity needed to deliver those goals. Key to this is developing a circular economy that keeps products and materials in high value for as long as possible and lessens our use of our natural resources. As part of our green recovery, we've already invested in active travel, in continuing to decarbonise the energy sector and in improving energy efficiency. This will be followed by announcements in the coming weeks in our programme for government and infrastructure investment plan and in December by our update to the 2018 climate change plan. COVID-19 has impacted all areas of our society, including employment. Education, skills and good jobs will need to be central to our green recovery. As we manage the economic impacts of COVID-19, Scotland has to be equipped with the right skills to undertake the sustainable jobs of the future. This is important for all, but particularly for our young people, whose first experiences in the job market could be badly affected by the combined shock of COVID-19 and Brexit. In furtherance of this, we've already announced £100 million of investment for employment support and training, with a commitment that £60 million of that funding will support a youth guarantee. Resetting our pathway to net zero while creating good jobs for people across Scotland will be the core objective of a just and green recovery from COVID-19. Uniquely, Scotland's net zero targets, ambitious as they are, are also underpinned by legislative commitment to just transition. The scale of the challenge of achieving net zero emissions is in no doubt. We have to manage risks and deliver a transition that is fair and inclusive. So we've embedded just transition principles into our climate change legislation and we've established the Just Transition Commission to provide us with independent advice on the opportunities and challenges of moving to a net zero economy. The Commission's report, published on 30th July, is very welcome and each of their recommendations will be considered closely. COVID-19 has shown how abrupt and unplanned shifts can exacerbate inequalities. We need to prepare and plan for our net zero transition in a way that mitigates risks and makes the most of the opportunities a green well-being economy offers. In this way, we can also make our society and economy more resilient to future shocks and provide stability and security to jobs and employment. Turning the tide on climate change requires a truly global response. Just as the response to COVID-19 has been universal, with countries assisting one another, our journey to net zero economies ought to be the same. Working in isolation is not an option and the Scottish Government is committed to working collaboratively and sharing best practice with partners both at home and internationally. The principles guiding Scotland's recovery ambitions must be reflected in the global approach to the climate crisis. The actions needed to reach net zero will transform all sectors of the world's economy and society. As the pace of the transition increases, the need to ensure it is just becomes ever more important. Central to this will be ensuring that all voices, including those from the global south, who are amongst the least responsible for the global climate emergency, but are being first and most severely affected by it, are represented and heard. Our ambitions for economies centred around well-being are similarly global. We are leading the way on well-being and sustainability on the global stage. We are a member of the WeGo group of well-being economy governments and use this platform to share expertise and policy practices among governments with a shared ambition of delivering well-being through our economic approach. It is more important now than ever that we address the pressing economic, social and environmental challenges of our time and fostering these partnerships is crucial. 
These next two years will be a critical time for climate action, with 2020 marking five years since the Paris Agreement and November 2021 seeing the postponed COP26 take place in Glasgow. The delay to COP26 must not mean a delay to collective global action to tackle climate change. It is necessary that in the run-up to this significant event, we champion climate action at all levels, ultimately utilising the conference to promote the action and ambition of state and regional governments. We look forward to delivering a successful COP26 that engages sectors and communities across Scotland, helps increase global ambition and sets the world on course for a net zero future that is fair and just for all. Finally, we must ensure that Earth Overshoot Day, falling later this year, is not a one-off and that we set a long-term trend for decreased emissions and a more harmonious relationship with our natural resources. Thank you. Thank you very much out there to the Cabinet Secretary, who, as I say, was, uh, is joining us live for our discussions today as well. So we will pick up on some of the uh, thoughts that were made in that speech throughout this session. Thank you to those already engaging online. It's great to see you all chatting as, as you're watching this uh, and great to see so many of you joining from all over the world. Uh, thank you very much for that. And in answer to a popular question that's being asked already, yes, Mathis's slides will be available and there are details on the chat of how you can access them. They were fantastic slides, weren't they? Uh, so I want to open this up now and introduce some of the other speakers uh, we have joining us uh, this evening for this session. Uh, we're going to go now to Terry Ahern, who's Chief Executive of the Scottish Environment Protection Agency. Hello, Terry. Hi, Steph. Hello, good to see you. Uh, now, my first question is, you're, you are actually Australian, aren't you? So I want to know what it was that first attracted you to Scotland. <laughs> that was the weather. <laughs> no, it was, um, I wanted to work somewhere where I could run an EPA that uh, could make a really big difference, not just make an incremental difference. And as you've heard from our Cabinet Secretary, Scotland has huge ambitions, not just to improve the environment, but to do it in a way that creates a different economy. And that means it's a great place to run an EPA. of SEPA is to is one planet prosperity, isn't it? So can you just tell me about that and the background to it? Well, if you think about it, our job is to get people to stick to the laws. So um, people expect us to make a business uh, meet the environmental laws. We do that. What Mathis, simple figure, that one da data point, 1 1.6 times of using the planet from August the 22nd shows us is that a regulator that makes people stick to the law is not enough. Because if we were to get everyone in Scotland to stick to the law, we've got to do that, that's absolutely critical. But unless they go much further, we won't be shifting that date and we won't move that overuse of the planet from 1.6 back towards one. So a regulator has to be a partner in innovation. A regulator has to be supportive of progressive businesses and what to do, not just the right thing in meeting the law, but go way further. And do, I mean, this it's an um, ambitious ethos as well, isn't it? And, and it feels quite unusual for a regulator to be working in this way. Look, I've got a simple test I think every organisation should apply. And it's this, you should surprise everyone you deal with. So uh, it doesn't surprise people if I say that SEPA sometimes work with, works with Scottish Enterprise, the government's economic development agency, to make sure that an investment... Uh, in Scotland from a business gets done on time in terms of approvals. That's what we do. But it does surprise people when I say that Scottish Enterprise is SEPA's most important public partner in Scotland. And that for Steve Dunlop, their CEO and I, we are determined to stand side by side with every business we deal with to help them dematerialise and decarbonise what they do through their supply chains. That surprise and shocks people. And when you do that, if you're surpri surprising people, what you're doing is you're not doing business as usual. So one of the biggest mantras in this field, whether it's climate change, biodiversity collapse, earth overshoot days, business as usual isn't going to get us there. Well, if you surprise people you're dealing with, you're not doing business as usual. And if you don't surprise people, you are. So you ain't doing enough. Yeah, uh, we've got a question in from um, Jane, who, who's watching, who says, um, so a regulator is pushing for changes in law or changes in practice, or is it both? 
Uh, well, it's both the Cabinet Secretary and uh, Government and Parliament set the laws. So it's a bit like football, uh, where the referee, we don't set the laws, we apply them. But there's nothing to stop us, whatever laws are set, helping people go further on a voluntary basis. And that's the key. And for us, um, if 80% if of what we do is getting people on a voluntary basis to go even further than the laws that are set, and Scotland's got very um, high standards and ambitious laws, as the Cabinet Secretary said, that's where we'll make a really, really big difference. Yeah. Uh, uh, Terry, stay with us because I know we've got lots more to ask you as well. I want to bring in Professor Jamie Tawney now, who is Director of the Centre of Sustainable Solutions at the University of Glasgow. Uh, thank you very much uh, for joining us. Um, could you just tell me a bit about why the University of Glasgow has decided to be part of this collaboration? Yeah, I think that uh, we're in a really key position at the moment with the resources that we have in terms of the younger generations of students that we have in terms of the research which um, is a really creative way to come up with new ideas um, and the partnerships that we can build are incredibly important to moving this agenda forward i think it's really difficult for any individual or any one organization to think about how they're going to change or make a difference in terms of the the huge picture that we're looking at but I think if we start um, bringing the people together who know what change needs to be made with those who know how to make the change and with those who can then implement the changes, kind of as Terry was talking about the government and the regulators and the businesses, if we all work together, then we can tackle the problem. Yeah. And are you seeing that this is making a difference already? I, I think I am. I mean, there's huge uh, positivity and huge goodwill for everybody that I speak with that they want to make a change. And that hasn't been hampered at all um, by COVID-19. COVID-19 is certainly a disruption that's happened. But I think the, the goodwill, um, we're, we're working quite a lot with the Glasgow City Council um they they're leading a number of initiatives and we're leading a number of initiatives to work on everything from energy to the waterways um and and thinking about how citizens and communities in glasgow actually contribute to the solutions to this problem yeah uh, and again jamie if you could sit tight for me uh because i just want to bring in some of the our other panelists and then we'll come back to you with some more questions do keep sending them in thank you for those that have already been sent in on the chat uh, i'm going to bring in sandrine dixon to cleave now co-president of the club of rome which coincidentally was uh, co-founded by a scot the scientist alexander king um sandrine you're joining us from brussels today aren't you and you're hot off the heels from another yeah. uh, european earth overshoot day event earlier today aren't you which i heard went fantastic so i'm expecting great things Things from you, Sandrine. Well, I don't know. I'm hopeful that I can actually um, answer your your request in terms of great things. But I think we're in front of a very dire situation, Steph. And I I, I want to first commend Scotland, um, SIPA, and also the the cabinet and the first minister for showing incredible leadership. I think it's really important as we look at what's happening in terms of COVID and the link with the convergence of two other tipping points, biodiversity loss and climate, that we bring these three together during this time, even though it is difficult and we are focusing on our livelihoods and, and, and living in particular as we're facing the pandemic that's before us. And the reason for that is some of the references that were already made by the cabinet minister and, and also by Terry and others, which is that we can learn from this COVID moment in terms of how we can actually transform and innovate. And what we're seeing in terms of Scotland also, in terms of your building resilience through your well-being economy, these are learning points that will enable us to better understand how we can move beyond growth as the only indicator of where we need to go in terms of a future economy. Because what we've seen is that overconsumption, hence why we are in overshoot, has put us in the situation that we're in today. Overconsumption of resources, overconsumption of materials, overconsumption in terms of the way in which we grow our food, all of this has culminated into a dire impact on our planet. What we often say at the Club of Rome, and we have been saying for the last 50 years, 
is that we are no longer in an empty world. We are now in a world of 7.8 billion people who are all actually asking for the same level of prosperity that we are seeing in the North. And that cannot continue because of the impact that we're putting on our planet. So we've gone way beyond our planetary boundaries. Now, what does that mean in terms of what we can do? Well, the cabinet minister and the work that SIPA is doing has already started to show that actually we have solutions, whether they be technological solutions or shifts within the way in which we look at indicators to prosperity and the well-being indicators. We at the Club of Rome have developed a planetary emergency plan which says both that we are in the midst of an emergency, but we also can emerge from emergency if we apply these measures right now. This is a decade of action. And in fact, this year is a super year. It was the year where we were supposed to see COP26. And I think that under Scottish leadership, we can continue to see how we can apply new economic indicators to ensuring that actually we can meet our climate goals and our climate targets. Because without those indicators, we will not meet them. Maybe my last point would be, Steph, that actually I believe that most people do not want to go back to business as usual. That the surveys have indicated very clearly that actually our future is moving forward. That people want access to bare essentials, that people want to feel that actually they are healthy, that they have access to jobs, but they don't necessarily need to have three cars to make them happy, or even two, or even one in some cases, as we see the youth is actually very much moving away from an economy based on consumption. Yeah, I mean, you paint an incredible picture there. And, and I think you're right, so much there. Is, again, that I know lots of people have questions about. I'm going to bring in the Cabinet Secretary again now, just for more of a chat on this, because um, Cabinet Secretary, Scotland was one of the first nations, wasn't it, to declare a climate emergency and set ambitious targets. And of course, we heard there more about the investment that's going to come from Scotland on this. Why do you think it's important for small nations to be ambitious on this? Um, well, I think ambition um, is going to be important regardless of, of the size of nation. But um, small nations, uh, I think, are in a really good position to show leadership, partly because it is possible in a small nation to have a national conversation much more easily. And then you've seen some evidence of that with what Terry Ahern um, has said, um, you know, it is our capacity to do that conversation um, when you're not a huge country um, is is increased, um, and the and the desire for ambition is perhaps greater in small nations as well. Um, so I think it's really really important. I know when I'm speaking to people from other countries, they are usually um, surprised um, at the ambition that Scotland has. Um, but I could point to other small nations as well um, with great ambition and uh, uh, jointly um, the small nations of the world, of course, can collectively um, uh, basically have a really big footprint of their own. And in that sense, um, I also want to make the point about um, uh, non-party stakeholders in, in all of this. Now, we are members of the under two coalition, um, you know, because uh, for our for our country, we don't have all of the full powers um, that uh, uh, the the states have. The, the the stakeholders, the party, the the party stakeholders do at COP26. We are working with a a smaller set of powers, but across the globe, those sub sub party stakeholders, non party stakeholders, collectively make up an enormous uh, contribution to to being able to. To, to make change. And across the globe, it is generally in, in amongst those uh, 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 people that you find the greatest ambition uh, and the greatest impact. Um, and, and that's really telling. And there may be a lot of different reasons for it, but I think that maintaining that ambition um, when you're a small nation is incredibly important. You become an exemplar. There are things that Scotland has done um, where we are still the only country to have done it. I mean, paradoxically, um, Scotland, as far as I'm aware, is still the only country where 
um, the you, you, I, as the government minister, have to stand in front of my parliament every single year and report on uh, our annual emissions reductions. In a legis it's fixed in legislation. No other country does that. Um, no other country has put just transition principles embedded into uh, the drive towards climate change. Um, so I think that small countries can be exemplars. Um, I know Scotland has uh, has done that in a number of areas, um, and that other countries, other small countries, um, are equally as ambitious. Um, would that some of the larger countries um, would uh, follow that same ambitious uh, um, desire? Hmm, yeah, and I'm going to come back to um, leadership of other countries in a moment. A uh, couple of questions just coming in uh, as well, just asking Cabinet Secretary about the reporting system that the Scottish government used to track its progress on the country's ecological footprint. What is it? How, how are you monitoring it and how are you making sure that it is making a difference? Well, we are obliged to, as I said, um, I mean, I'm obliged to make a statement every single year in Parliament um, as to our progress um, in terms of emissions reductions. And, and uh, um, there, there is a time lag. I mean, one of the difficulties that you have, of course, is you can't, it's not a real time report. The, 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 the reporting is generally for the, for the year, two years ago. Um, and that always creates a little bit of an issue um, uh, for us. And we're currently in the process of trying to refine uh, um, some of our uh, measuring capacity. That This is an issue, a big conversation that kind of bedevils um, uh, um, bedevils most uh, reporting systems. How how do you refine it? We are looking very carefully at uh, how we align, for example, our budget and uh, our climate change uh, ambitions as well, so that we ensure that that across government is actually um, brought together. Because there's another area where it can sometimes go adrift. Um, so there's a lot happening and a lot currently changing um, because we are trying to move to a better and more efficient way of expressing it um, and uh, uh, you know that is I think a conversation that is probably a going to continue but b will be happening in many other countries as well. Yeah thank you. Um, Sandrine can I bring you back in I just want to ask you a bit about you know we saw in 2015 didn't we the the Paris Climate Agreement it was signed by 197 nations around the world but since then it really feels like you know, the attitudes from different countries from heads of state have kind of really diverged, haven't they? You know, if you compare, for example, Donald Trump with, say, Nicola Sturgeon, of course, or Jacinda Ardern, um, how do you get consensus, do you think? So I think we've actually, and this is a very good point that was just made by the cabinet minister around non-state actors, because I think what happened in Paris is that we saw the power of non-state actors and non-state actors also included local authorities, for example. I think now we are in an age where we realize that real impact is also going to come from leadership elsewhere, not just heads of state, unfortunately. And that means that we have, for example, 1,700 jurisdictions from across the globe in 32 different countries that have declared climate and planetary emergency and that are putting in plans of action. We have local authorities like the government of Amsterdam that are in the process of putting in place a donut economic model that very much is centered on well-being. And we're starting to see that there are many more local authorities, whether it be in the United States, most of the states actually are doing much more in the area of climate action and also biodiversity preservation than at the national level, clearly, as we're seeing with Donald Trump. So we cannot despair. I think we need to remember that actually we have paid, paid too much attention to heads of state and we've paid too much attention to the national level. And this is something also that the youth are reminding us, that the voice of the youth and the voice of so many different actors, including the business community, by the way, if we look at COP26 and the fact that it's been postponed, what we're still going to see under the leadership of Nigel Topping, who you saw as one of the vid videos in the very beginning of this program, which is that we're going to have net zero dialogues for two weeks, some of them taking place in Glasgow and elsewhere and virtually. And we're going to set up the initial day around what does a system look like in this new decarbonized world also post COVID. We will have very deep conversations and actions that will be put forward by different sectors 
industrial sectors in order to really revolutionize and transform these sectors. That's why the just transition work that's being done in Scotland and elsewhere, elsewhere, also at the European level where we have a just transition fund is so important so that we can start to put aside the necessary funds some of them, by the way, that are going to come from the elimination of perverse subsidies to fossil energy and agriculture. Others, which will be new funds, but the finance sector is telling us they have the money. It's a question of reallocation of those funds to green projects, to green technology. I often say it is not the lack of solutions that are stopping us. It is often the political will in some nations that is trying to halt progress. And I think we need to remember that if we're going to build back better post COVID, we have no other option than to embrace a new type of economy. Who knows what this pandemic is going to leave us with? And don't mm. think that actually this will be the only pandemic because there will be more and other crises. So to do that, yeah. to emerge stronger, we must put in place new economic indicators and new frameworks to enable us to be more resilient. Yeah, uh, again, definitely stuff we want to pick up on there. Uh, Sandrine, thank you. Can I bring in Mathis back in now? Because I know, Mathis, you want to add to this, don't you? Thank you. I think one of the big misconceptions actually is that global agreement is absolutely needed. Of course, it would be beautiful to have global agreement, but waiting for global agreement is not a good business strategy. It's like when you sit in a boat, you see a storm come. Why would you say, I will not fix my boat until everybody else is fixing their boat first? Actually, without agreement, the case for action is even stronger. And that's why I look at Scotland with great joy to say, yeah, they recognize they are in a boat. They are preparing themselves. The big question is not, oh, are you nice to the world? Of course, that's nice. But in the end, are you preparing yourself to be operational in the future? Are you destroying yourself? Are you preparing yourself for the future that we can anticipate? Because we know a lot about the future. We know that people will want to eat. We, will, we know that people will want to sleep. We know that people want to be safe and move around. And we also know there will be climate change and resource constraints. And so those who have economies and infrastructure that are able to operate in that context, they will be able to do quite well. So waiting for others is just the worst business plan. It's really interesting you say that, Mathis, because it, it kind of sometimes goes against common sense to think, oh, you need agreement, you need agreement. But you're right. You know, I see it as a business journalist. Uh, businesses, the ones that do well are the ones that don't let all the kind of uncertainty and the waiting for agreement paralyze them. They instead go and do what they can do. And, and it sounds like that is what's needed. And yeah. talking we, of business perspective, oh, sorry, go on, Mathis, we wanted to. Yeah, no, no. And we, we just did actually an ebook with Schneider Electric that 140,000 employees, global company. And they recognize that in order to avoid your own obsolescence, you need to ask this core strategic question, are my offerings, are my products and services enabling humanity to succeed? And succeeding means that we all want to thrive within the limits of our uh, planetary budget. And if your business can affirm this and say, yes, we help humanity succeed, you, you avoid obsolescence and all the others they are planning for their own obsolescence. So actually sustainability and business case are much more tightly related than people believe. It's not about a noble cause. We, we seem to like noble because it sounds so noble, but in the end, it's much more about necessary. It's a necessary mm -hmm. ingredient without which we're moving to its misery. Yeah, which is a perfect point to bring in John Elkington, who is an experienced businessman, of course, but also the creator of the triple bottom line concept, people, planet, profit. Um, John, do you think business is getting this now? Steph, I think the simple answer is that leading companies, leading businesses do understand that the world is very different and they're going to have to change with it. And I look at somebody like Paul Pullman, who was the uh, CEO of Unilever, who was um, originally chairman of the B Richard Branson's B team with about 20 leaders. He was uh, chairman of the World Business Council for Sustainable Development with about 200 uh, businesses. He's now been invited to chair the International Chamber of Commerce with 45 million businesses around the world. Now, that includes a lot of people who haven't even begun to get the message. But nonetheless, I think there is momentum uh, building. And there are several reasons why I think that's going to continue, despite COVID-19 and in some ways because of the pandemic. And the first is that younger people bring a very different set of values uh, into 
the workplace now. Now, they're, they're going to struggle to get into the workplace very often for the next uh, couple of years, I suspect. But nonetheless, their values will not, I think, materially shift. But much more urgent for business leaders is that the financial markets have finally, after a very long time, are now waking up uh, to this whole agenda. And you hear a lot of talk about environment, uh, social and governance, or ESG investing. And interestingly, ESG investment has done better through uh, the pandemic and, and, and the uh, recession that it's uh, triggering than normal forms of investment. And just a final point, when, when you talk to businesses now and you ask them when you go, they go out on what are called investor roadshows to talk to uh, financial people, investors and others, uh, they used to get very few questions on sustainability or climate change or these sorts of issues, now they've been grilled. And I actually think that's uh, a very encouraging sign. So to your question, yes, but perhaps not fast enough. Yeah, it's interesting that because, uh, uh, John, a lot of my work now tends to be chairing sessions about ESG and about, you know, what companies are doing. For example, yesterday I was doing one with the insurance sector talking about, you know, using recycled car parts. Maybe if someone's had a car accident, instead of just always going for the new thing, you look at recycled. And it, it is really interesting because it feels like it's gone from a box ticking kind of corporate social responsibility thing to actually we can make money from this as well as doing a duty of sustainability. I think so. And I think one of the things that's happening also alongside the business awakening is that business schools, which actually have been laggards in this, I mean, there have been exceptions to that rule, but they've been very slow to pick up on uh, the fact that the future is going to be very different. So they've been con continuing to train uh, people for the old Order. I was on a call uh, earlier on today to a business school in Japan, and they're positioning themselves as a business school for the 22nd century. Now, we've already heard various people talk about ambition. I think Scotland is suddenly extremely exciting, and it's only partly because it's a small uh, country or a smaller uh, country. And I think it's fascinating now to see not just smaller countries, but cities and urban regions starting to pick up on all of this. But in the end, it has to be business that uh, takes the lead, and business leaders have to be trained uh, in the right uh, way. So I'm actually extremely optimistic, weirdly, at the moment, probably more so than I have been for about uh, five to seven years. Yeah, that's fantastic to hear. Before I let you go, John, can I just ask you then for anyone watching who is in uh, a business owner or someone in business who wants to make a difference, what would your advice be in terms of tackling this and, and pushing more of a case for it? Well, for, for 20 years, uh, people like me have tried to bring the outside world into the world of business, into boardrooms, into C-suites and so on. And that was originally people like Greenpeace, Oxfam, those sorts of things. And I, I think businesses still have to do that. But actually now it's flipping. And my, my advice to uh, companies of all sizes, all sectors, in all geographies is, for God's sake, get out more. Go and talk to some of the people who are creating the future. That isn't simply NGOs. It might be SEPA. It might be you know, the Scottish Enterprise Agencies. All sorts of uh, people are starting to experiment and innovate, as you well know, Steph. Um, business people are often quite ignorant about a lot of that work. I think they should be doing learning journeys, studying study tours, uh, getting out and, and, and seeing where the future is actually being formed, and then thinking, how do they play into that? Uh, going forward. This is an incredibly exciting uh, time for business if they can get their brain around it in good time and good order. John, thank you very much. I'm also incredibly impressed with your book selection. Uh, quite a collection there behind, John. <laughs> it's interesting, isn't it? Now we're doing all of these type of events online. You get to see a sneak peek of people's houses and book collections. Uh, but John Elkington there, thank you very much. Um, we, we've talked a lot, haven't we, uh, about youth as well. And so it feels like a really uh, good point to bring in Katrina Patterson, who's from the 2050 Climate Group. Um, Katrina, you know, when we talk about who is most engaged with this topic, tackling climate change, it often is younger people, isn't it? If we look at the Greta Thunbergs, the school climate activists, or the, the leaders who are actually making a big difference seem to be the younger leaders. So... You know, they have an important role to play, don't they? Whatever organisation they're in, the, the young leaders who are there now to actually make a difference. 
Yes, and it's been really exciting to hear um, my fellow panelists kind of citing the youth of today as being a major inspiration and also acknowledging their potential to drive change. I think where we need to go now is looking at how do we create and elevate young people into decision making roles. Um, because it's no longer a given that uh, the older you are, the better decision you make. Um, and particularly when decisions that are being made now um, about our future are the ones which are going to be setting up the future of our industry, the future of our societies, the future of our well-being. You know, a lot of Scotland's climate change targets are uh, set up for uh, the year 2045. Everyone who's under the age of 35 now will be in the workforce at that time. So it's actually us who are going to be living that reality uh and yeah. 2050 climate group oh sorry okay no i was just going to say yeah i mean tell us a bit about what you guys are doing in the uh the 2050 climate group because it's key to this isn't it this is your your thing <laughs> yes it's definitely our passion uh so 2050 climate group is a youth-led volunteer-led charity uh, based in scotland and working in scotland and malawi to empower young leaders to take climate action towards a just and sustainable society so we kind of recognize that young people need both climate change knowledge and leadership skills to be able to make that jump towards being a current and future decision makers. And I know some of them are actually on the call right now. We've trained over 500 people in Scotland to be able to take climate action. And that's across every sector, public, private, third sector, fourth sector, health, finance, education, agriculture, transport, pretty much anything that you can think of. And that has led to both uh, action in the kind of personal lives and different spheres of influence, workplace strategy and practices, and also policy making at the local, national, regional, um, and potentially international um, policy making as well. So it's it's about kind of creating that network of young people who are all kind of prepared, ready, and unable to take action. Um, but I think it's not just always up to young people to to lead. It's also up to current decision makers to support and collaborate on that leadership to kind of set us all up for a positive future. Yeah, it's got to, it's like, it feels like life now needs to be 360, doesn't it? We've always got to be looking up and down wherever we are in, in, in our organisation. Have you got any examples, Katrina, of, of things that have been done within organisations? Because you were listing there lots of different sectors. So have you got any kind of tangible examples we can hear about? So I think one thing, um, for example, uh, well, obviously plastic has been one of the major things when we're talking about resource consumption and impact that choices that we make around resources are having an effect on uh, Scotland and our, our wider world. So one of our young leaders, Jamie Wiley, founded Plastic Free Perthshire, this initiative working with um, businesses and kind of local society members in that region to kind of create change, which I think is a really good example of how it can work on a local level and then be scaled up to a, a more international level. We also have members of 2050 Climate Group sitting on um, the Single Youth Plastic Task Force, looking at how um, we can do this on a national scale and also on a a panel that's looking at how we can decouple resource consumption from growth and um, so that when we look at what our future is going to be like and um, that that's not always kind of uh, resource consumption is not always uh, associated particularly with positive um, lifestyles yeah um thank you very much Christina. Uh, sandrine you wanted to add something to this yeah, thanks for that stuff. And, and unfortunately, I, I have to leave. But I, I just I just wanted to add, first of all, that it's incredible to see what the youth is doing and the student associations. And today, we already had Greta and several of the Fridays for the Future leaders, all of them women, by the way, or young, young women, who were speaking to Chancellor Merkel. And, and I think that part of the, the role now of, of the youth is is to both think about what are what are the visions of the future that they want to see but also continue to hold all of us accountable and that's exactly what this voice of the youth has been for the last two years but what i wanted to do is also add to john's point that absolutely the business community along with the local authorities as i was mentioning are really stepping up to the plate i mean paul pullman is one of the most incredible examples but there are many others and also in sectors that we're now working with where you would not expect them to be moving forward the aluminium sector the steel sector we're actually we're starting to see net zero production plants aluminium as well and we're starting to see that at least here in europe because of the regulatory framework that we have and by the way, I'm hopeful that Scotland is still going to be a member of the European Union. I just need to put that point in. Um, 
that we will see that because of the regulatory structure through the European Green Deal that we are putting in, policymakers are trying very hard to work with business leaders to ensure that they can move forward and put in place the right technologies. And that needs also the insurance sector and the financial sector. So bringing all of those actors together to really create a deal that works for the future is what we actually need. And we are seeing that there are many actors that are stepping up to the plate now. Yeah, Sandrine, thank you so much. And thanks for your time uh, taking part in this session. And you were great. Thank you so for inviting me. <laughs> yeah, thank you for inviting Brilliant. me thank and you. go Scotland. <laughs> thank you. Um, I'm just going to come back to Katrina because I just want to pick up on a point there. Um, when, you know, we, we're talking about youth, how amazing they are, but at the other end of the scale, what can, I don't know, it's, it's it feels weird saying the young and the old, but what can the more experienced, shall we say, in business do to help younger people? Like what 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 kind of things can they do to enable the, the young leaders in their business or organisation to be able to make progress? Yes, yeah, so I think when we're talking about why young people are impactful about climate change. It's often about their passion, their ambition, and their action. And so to engage with young people and also to, to benefit from that, businesses really have to recognize that leadership can happen at different levels in an organization and across society. So uh, there's kind of, like, I guess, like three things that I would normally advise to any kind of business wanting to do this. And that is to empower that passion of young people by listening rather than just paying lip service, by platforming young people. So for example, my participation in this webinar, um, and by sustaining them, so supporting in different ways, I would equip equip that uh, um, the action um, by creating more opportunities um, for young people at different decision making roles, either within their organisation, within different groups that they participate in. I would trust the ideas that people come up with and and have a go. You know, we need we need new ideas, we need new experiments to to kind of try and create a better future. I would also partner with youth led organisations. Um, the the structures exist for that to happen. And the climate groups always really much about working in partnership and collaboration. We're not trying to do this by ourselves. And then finally, I would say about like enabling that ambition, you know, train younger people, create new positions for them to be part of it, invest in youth led businesses. Um, and really, when it comes to passion and ambition and action, I think it's crucial for any responsible and sustainable business of the future to be embedding that in how they work. But it's also really just essential for a prosperous and socially just business in the present. Um, so any business that doesn't really want to have a really future focused, savvy, intelligent, active young person as part of their team, you know, I don't know what they're doing. <laughs> yeah, it comes back to uh, uh, what Mathis and John were saying about actually, this is for the good of organisations. It's not just, oh, we'll help the young people do what they need to do. It's actually, this is what we all need to do and it will be good in every way. Um, I'm going to bring the Cabinet Secretary back in if I can. Just on that point about young people, I know a couple of people have asked about this as well. Um, Adita's asked, what's the Scottish Government doing to support the youth population as they are going to be in the future workforce? And I know you mentioned about employment and support and training so what do you see an opportunity here from this agenda in terms of skills well there is a huge opportunity but of course right now because of covid there's also a massive challenge um and working our way out of um the real problems that the covid emergency has brought us um uh, it means that we've got to be thinking extremely cleverly about how we set things up for the future i was scribbling down one or two things um, uh, one of the earlier uh, contributors um, who, who was talking about the workplace. And I was sort of thinking, of course, we've got a whole new concept of workplace now. Um, uh, and it, we've got to think in terms of new kind of jobs. And there is a real danger for all governments. And, uh, you know, for the best of reasons, if they build back too fast at the moment, what they'll be doing is building back last year's jobs. Um, and what we really need to be doing is building um, the jobs for the future, the kind of green jobs that are going to be needed for the future. And, and I hope very much there's a huge conversation going on within uh, different parts of the Scottish Government right now. I hope very much that we are going to be able to do precisely that. Um, uh, take this opportunity now to start trying to uh, ensure that what we're doing is is 
funding um, the right kind of jobs that will take us forward into the future, but also making sure that there is a, a place not just for the creation of new jobs, but for retraining and reskilling, because that is a huge challenge that's going to be confronting us just within a very few weeks, probably. Um, and we are going to have to have some, some answers for that. And that goes back to what I was talking about, the just transition idea that you've got to be really thinking very hard about that. The, the danger is that that we're, you know, the, that old saying about everybody fights the last war, not the one they're in. And we have to be careful not to be fighting that last war. We've got to really be thinking about um, what do we need for the future. So, for example, in my portfolio area, there's some really hard work going on to identify where the real potential is for uh, uh, for jobs, particularly jobs for young people, um, across all of the range of work that you would expect in an environment portfolio, a climate change portfolio. Um, uh, um, but the but the COVID emergency has also um, taught us how quickly people can adapt, um, and uh, and in one sense, where some of the skills gaps already are that need to be addressed. So huge amount of work, very short space of time. All governments are going to be tackling, uh, uh, struggling with this. Um, I just hope very much that the, the, the things that we're talking about in the Scottish government will be absolutely the right things for the way we want to shape the, the green recovery over the next uh, number of years. Yeah, thank you very much, uh, Cabinet Secretary. C let's have a quick look at the polls now and, and see what you guys are saying on some of the questions that uh, we have asked you. Uh, those should pop up on the screen and we should be able to just run through some of the questions that you've been asked. There we go. So you can see the panellists as well. So do events like this help to change our trajectory? Ooh, kind of halfy half there, 49% agreeing, 49% said maybe 2% disagree. Uh, do you think the world will move at an accelerated pace and tackle climate change at COP26 in Glasgow next year? Uh, and then there's some thoughts on that. If each country and city recognises that climate action is their own interest, uh, the biggest there is if we take action rather than wait for global agreement, that comes back, doesn't it, to Mathis's point earlier on about not just waiting for everyone to agree, we actually need to get on and do what we can uh, now. Let's have a little scroll down and see what the others are saying. Uh, innovation and collaboration by public and private sector can cause suspicion. Is it right that the government, uh, public and private sector partners work together? Uh, overwhelming yes there. Uh, I think that that comes back again to uh, what we've been saying about collaboration and what areas should universities prioritise to help drive change? The big one there being building capacity through education, which comes back to what the Cabinet Secretary was saying. Um, Let's go back to uh, some more of our panellists now. I'm going to bring in Dagmar Drogsma, who's been watching. She's Director of Industry for the Scotch Whiskey Association. Thank you very much for uh, joining us. Um, as a global business that exports something like, what is it, 1.3 billion bottles of scotch every year to most of the nations who signed up to the Paris Agreement, I just wanted to ask you, what is the business case for sustainability, would you say, from your perspective? Obviously, we've heard a bit from John, but from the Scotch Whiskey Association, what would you say is the drive for sustainability? Well, sustainability is just really important for our member companies and they represent um, about 95 percent of the scots whiskey companies that we have in scotland so sipa tracks 33 sectors for their compliance on environmental law and for years now we've had the highest performance rate but that's not enough so since 2009 we had our own environmental strategy and that sets targets for issues for which there are no legal targets. So, for example, for reducing fossil fuels and energy use, for water efficiency, and also for dealing with packaging materials. At the moment, uh, we're doing a review of that strategy, and you will not be surprised to hear that that will focus very heavily on how we can go to net zero as an industry. And also on that, we want to be a leader. Another point that was mentioned by a couple of speakers is that um, you cannot do that on your own. So we are looking at our whole supply chain. And as an example, barley is a really important ingredient for our whiskey. So we're working with the farming sector, with maltsters, with scientists in the International Barley Hub, and also NGOs who we see as our critical friends to see how we can do and use that product sustainably and, and incorporate that in our whiskey. 
And, and then just directly to your question about the business case, for us, there are two key elements. So one is that the reputation of Scots whisky brands, so individual companies, but also as a sector as a whole, is based on good environmental practices and environmental leadership. And the second element very much relates to that, because we see worldwide that customers' demands are changing. So more and more, okay. our customers ask for a green product. And we fully anticipate that in, say, 10, 15 years, customers will not want to pay top dollar for what is a premium product if it is dirty. So if you consider that whiskey at the moment, say, that is made today, may only be on the market in 10 years' time, then clearly you've got to take action now. You can't wait. And so, yeah, I mm. hope that answers your question. But there's many aspects to this in terms of, you know, what you need to do as a business sector, but also what you can do. Yeah. Uh, and you mentioned the, the collaboration you've been doing as an organisation, talking about things like working with the farming sector. What's what's that been like? Has the appetite been there to do that? Because obviously it's quite challenging for industries like farming at the moment. It is. But I think um, what's interesting, so we've got a working group with all the different actors around the table. So the farming organisations, maltsters, NGOs, government. And I think really that they've welcomed it. I mean, their nightmare scenario is probably that we just on our own determined that we want something from sustainable barley, but they're not part of the story. And so this is about working together to make sure that in this case, barley, I mean, that's just one example, that it's resilient, that it meets the demands of sustainability, um, et cetera. So I think they've really, really welcomed the dialogue as opposed to us just doing things on our own. Yeah. Uh, and Terry, can I bring you in at this point as well, Terry from SEPA? Just on that point about the, the, what the appetite's like, you, you know, you were talking about how important it is now to work with enterprise. Have you found that there, there, is, that there is a positive reception from them, from the businesses you're working with? So we get a mix. Some businesses require what I would we describe as our traditional service offering. So some of them need a kick and we give it to them if that's what they need. <laughs> but there are, there are plenty more that know that this is a challenge and that they won't exist as viable businesses unless they get on uh, this pathway. I think the critical thing about uh, what Dagmar was just saying is we regulate the distilleries. So they had a 94% uh, compliance rate last year, as Dagmar said, the highest out of our 33 sectors. But... That, and that's really critical. It's really important. It provides local environmental protection in particular. But if you think about whiskey, the majority of the environmental impact is through the global supply chain. So the sort of initiatives they've got require SEPA to step up because we also regulate the farmers and say, well, how do we work in partnership with people through supply chains? And I think one of the most important things for regulators and businesses to do is say, how do we share risk and return through supply chains? Because often what gets in the way of unlocking environmental improvements through supply chains is the costs go to someone and then the revenue goes to someone else or the risk falls somewhere and or more than uh, it does somewhere else we need to get together and share risk and return and that includes us we've got mechanisms now where we can share some of the risk with the businesses we regulate yeah um and Dagmar uh, talking of supply chains I'm guessing these are the conversations that you're having then and what would your advice be to again people in a similar situation who are trying to get their uh, the businesses they work with in the supply chain to be more sustainable I think at first you need to really understand indeed um, how your supply chain works and build the relationships my advice would be have a very open conversation I think people, um, well, we have experienced that um, our supply chain partners really value that. And also an, a conversation which is about finding solutions together. And so um, another initiative that we have is of the packaging sector, which is hugely important for us. And what we're thinking about now is developing, you know, an, an, a roadmap together with them so that we can see a trajectory where our packaging gets cleaner and cleaner and cleaner. We won't be waiting for new legislation from Scottish or UK government here. We'll just get on with it. But have that conversation early on. Be very open about what your desires are and do it jointly. 
Yeah. And it's interesting you mentioned about customers actually asking for green products because uh, Louise Shields uh, online has asked a, a great question on this. Um, young people and older people's consumption often doesn't align to their desire for sustainability. So how do you change the mindsets on the ownership of stuff being a mark of how successful you are? Um, I mean, I could put this to any of you, to be honest. So, Jamie, uh, do you want to start us on this? What your thoughts are and, and how you, you know, you match that up, that desire for sustainability and, oh, I've got to have all this materialism in my life. So I think the key is to start off by making small changes. Um, as an example, I don't own a car. Um, Glasgow is a fantastic place to be and Scotland's a fantastic place to be because you can get around without a car. Um, I think it's, it's up to everyone to look at their own individual choices and see what sort of changes they can make. Um, yeah. Yeah. Uh, Katrina, I guess it's about pointing things out to people as well and, and maybe giving them statistics on things. What do you think? I think this also really aligns to um, how we, well, as Jamie said, it's, it's kind of at different scales. So it really aligns to the whole conversations that are happening at the moment around shifting to a well-being economy. So at the moment, we, um, through using a GDP-based metric of success, um, we automatically bake that in, like economic success and, and consumption and having stuff as being something which is, is something to aspire to. But if we change our value system at a national level and at a personal level, then um, I th don't think resource consumption will be something which um, we will hold aloft as much. Um, I also think that you balance, when you're talking about shifting personal decisions, um, you also have to think about who is able to make those decisions because often, um, to have at the moment to have a more sustainable lifestyle is also more expensive and it's not accessible to people who um, are otherwise like suffering hardship particularly at a time of um, COVID-19. Yeah, uh, Mathis what are your thoughts on, on changing attitudes for people who are kindly uh, are kind of thinking oh you know yeah I'm, I'm a bit greener now but not really embracing it as much as probably all the people who are watching this do? I think the core really is do people feel they have skin in the game or not? Or do they just watch from the outside? If, if I just could ask one thing, you know, what's the one thing? I would say give up saying should. Because when you say should, it will never happen. If you say, oh, we should drive a little less, that's not very inspiring. But if you say, what do you really want? What do you love? I want to live in a city without cars. That becomes your passion. That becomes you. That becomes your vision. So the more we can recognize what do we really want, that's shifting on which trajectory we are. Yeah. Um, loads of comments and things coming in here. Um, and uh, we've got questions about uh, population, whether that's an issue. Um, Carlos is talking about maybe we need to think about the concept of degrowth. Uh, any thoughts on this? Uh, who should I go to on this? Um, Jim, uh, Dagmar, do you want to give me your thoughts from a business perspective? I mean, I can't ever see businesses wanting to degrowth, but what are your thoughts? No, that's a really hard thing to say, uh, um, working for a business sector, um, and, and the idea would not be to degrowth. However, and I don't uh, think that may necessarily answer the question, as a consumer, you've got an awful lot of power and you can demand from you know, whatever product you buy that it is sustainable. So, you know, as a minimum, you can demand that everything that is consumed is sustainable and, and business will follow on that. No, that's not necessarily degrowth, but at least it is more sustainable. Plus, let's face it, we've also learned actually in Scotland, in the UK and in Europe, that you can decouple doing the right thing on sustainability from economic growth. You know, our economies have grown. I mean, I know this year is a difficult year, but generally it has grown, whereas we have taken lots of environmental measures. So perhaps that is another way of looking at it. Yeah, uh, Samantha makes an important point, which Jamie, I'd, I'd, I'd like to put to you. So um, she says, we need to improve the places we live and change how new places are being designed and built to assist people to uptake sustainable living. That's a really good point, isn't it? You've got to make it easier for people. And that probably starts at home, looking at how we live and, and how we work, Jamie. 
Yeah, I think that's absolutely true. It comes down to some degree of personal choice. And it comes down, as you were hinting at before, too, around education. So we need to make information available to people about those choices that they're making so that they can make informed decisions about what they're doing, too. And I think the university plays quite a strong role in that sort of thing where we have so many students coming through and so many young people. Um, we just we just need to find ways to communicate um, with the community and with the students and get those messages out so people can make informed decisions. Yeah, I mean, there are some people making the point online about how, you know, individual consumer choices make a difference, but still, you know, it's it's a handful of industrial polluters that are having the, the greatest impact. Um, Jamie, have you got any thoughts on that? Um, yeah, I mean, so I have been speaking about individuals quite a lot, but obviously, um, as Rosanna Cunningham has said, it needs to be come down to government working with businesses, working with regulators. I think everybody, as Mathis said too, has skin in the game. They need to recognize they have skin in the game and they really need to become part of this movement to make the planet a better place for all of us to live. Yeah, uh, thanks, Jamie. Uh, I'm going to go to the cabinet secretary now, just uh, listening to all of that. Are there any thoughts you wanted to add to uh, what people have been saying? Oh, Lord, I could go on for ages and you don't have ages. Um, I, I just want to pick up uh, a couple of things. Um, first of all, um, on the issue of, of individual behavior change and personal choice. Um, so I think this is important, but we are in danger, I think, of overloading it um, uh, to a point that is unsustainable. Um, I'm sorry, that wasn't really meant as a pun. Um, but, you know, we can all of us uh, uh, put forward some of our individual choices and forget that actually you have to enable people to be able to make those choices. And some of the things that we talk about um, and some of the things that we want people to do um, aren't as easy as we might imagine. So here's a, here's a really trivial example. I switched to using wooden toothbrushes 18 months ago. But wooden toothbrushes are more expensive for people to buy. So that's okay for me. It's not necessarily okay for somebody who is really struggling. I want them to shell out more in order to do the right thing to make that correct individual choice. It is our job to make that easier for people rather than to put the responsibility entirely on them. I'm not saying they don't have some agency in this, but it's not fair to load this all onto individuals because whoever it was that uh, talked about um, some big uh, polluting sectors, um, and we might talk about some countries who are not stepping up to the challenge. Um, individual behavior, of course, if it is global, will make a change. But for a lot of people, you would be asking them to do things which actually are perhaps not going to be very easy for them to do. So um, I don't want us just to be talking about individual behavior. We need to encourage it, but we have to make, particularly those of us who are in government, have to make it possible for people to make those right choices. And that possibility might be about accessibility. It might be about um, inequality uh, uh, problems. It might be a whole lot of issues that are stopping people making those good choices. So I, I, I just caution everybody uh, about thinking this is really just about multiplying 7.8 billion individual choices and then we get the magic answer. I'm not sure that's how it is going to work. Um, secondly, to go back to some of the things that were said earlier, I think partnership is really incredibly important. That undoubtedly governments set a kind of agenda, but we are not going to be able to do this on our own either. Governments cannot do this on their own. Um, the, the private sector is absolutely vital to this. Um, and that partnership has to take it forward. And I know that that sometimes results in some uncomfortable conversations and, and there's, there's some thinking out there that would prefer us you know, not to, to, to do that. But I don't see how in reality it is possible um, for governments alone to achieve this. So we are all of us, all of us, all sectors and as individuals as well in this together. And I think the key thing is that we don't become discouraged by the by the challenge. Um, and I think there is a danger that um, we do become discouraged by the challenge. So I, I would say that the big thing we need to take from this is 
um, is is not to succumb to that uh, uh, to that that discouragement that that sense that we may as well give up because our individual effort, our little nation's work, our little bit of 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 input isn't really much more than one bean in an entire mountain of beans and we're the only ones that are doing it and i think that's so we've just got to manage all of that and it is really it's it's tough but there's a really good prize at the end of it um and so i want to try and stay and who was it was talking about this earlier i want to try and stay as optimistic as possible about this but we've all got to be part of it yeah, that was John's optimism, wasn't it, earlier? Uh, thank you very much. Um, Mathis, you started the session off for us uh, with your fantastic speech. Do you want to just give us your summation of things from what you've heard? Uh, it's, it's hard to summarize, obviously, but in the end, measure what you treasure. If we really treasure a future, a one planet prosperous future, we got to measure it. And that's why I would like to commend the Scottish government as well. That's why we're so excited to be in partnership because of three key things. One is they show their necessary ambition and there are too many other places where the necessary ambitions are not even shown. Second, what is particularly impressive and quite unique, unfortunately, it should be universal, is that I see a collaboration across various departments. It's not just the seventh wheel on the wagon, which is called the environment department. It's actually a collaboration between business sectors in government and with competitiveness uh, strategies and uh, health and well-being and environment all coming together. And the third thing that is even the most impressive part is that so many places have heard ambitions and they quietly fall off the wagon. Scotland actually has delivered 47% reduction in CO2 emissions since 1990. That's impressive and it's needed. And, and so that's why it's, it's exciting. I think bringing it back to basic numbers is not just a noble thing, it's a necessary thing. Yeah, Mathis, thank you very much. Uh, and thank you to all of our speakers. So many different thoughts uh, to come out of uh, this session, hopefully, and lots for you to continue talking about. You know, we talked about there, there isn't a lack of solutions out there. The problem sometimes in some particular countries is more the leadership. Um, but don't wait for agreement because we can all do our bit. It's about enabling people. It's about collaborating. And as Mathis said there, measure what you treasure. Uh, so thank you very much to all of our speakers. Um, we're going to have a look at the live polls now and see what the results are from the questions you've been answering for us again thank you so much for taking part in all of this uh, what more do we need uh, so what more do we need than robust scientific data for making the case for climate action uh, the key, clear winner there is clear pathways uh, and solution and then uh, we've got things like financing for climate action which was of course uh, something we talked about other questions we've asked who can most effectively drive change and uh, there's a fair mix there between governments, business and citizens. Uh, yeah, so we've all got a role to play, I think, is the point from that one. Has the world moved fast enough since the Paris Agreement to challenge global climate change? And overwhelmingly, there's a no there, but I think we're, we're all in agreement. But it was great to hear, wasn't it, some of the optimism from uh, Sandrine, also John, talking about uh, changes uh, and, and growth in business in this area. It's less of a box ticking thing and now more something actually businesses want to do as well uh, and organisations too. But thank you so much uh, for everyone who's taken part. Thank you for all of the questions that have come in uh, as well. Thanks for those of you who are just watching at home, quietly taking it all in. It's lovely to have have you uh, as part of all this. Just to remind you, of course, this Saturday is uh, Earth Overshoot Day. Whether you're a business, a public sector organization, a person who's just keen to do more, check out how to measure your personal footprint. The resources are available at Footprint Network, or one word, dot org. Uh, now, tonight's event is part of a series uh, by the Scottish Environment Protection Agency to mark Earth Overshoot Day and to uh, the hashtag move the debate. On Monday evening, politicians from Scotland's five Scottish political parties will join a webinar debate with Terry who we've been hearing from from CEPA Mathis of course from the Global Footprint Network uh, in a session chaired by Dr Poonam Malik from the Scottish Enterprise and the University of the Highlands and Islands. You can register for that event now by following the link at sepa.org.uk or you can follow the link we've just shared in the chat as well. There's actually a lot of information in that chat so if there's anything you would like to uh, perhaps see again if you want to see 
for example, Mathis's slides that he used. Uh, there's a link someone's put in the chat for those. So do feel free to access all of that. And thank you again for joining us. Remember, of course, share any pledges you make or any opinion you have online uh, across social media using the hashtag Hashtag move the date. Uh, and yes, it was been great to be part of this. So thank you very much for having me as well. And hopefully we'll all be continuing to do our bit. And next time we talk about this, we'll have moved the weeks further on. Uh, but thank you very much for me and do take care. Thanks. <laughs>